how is it in our world today of iPhones, internet, and international space stations that 663 million people don't have safe water? This is a huge number, and it's very hard to wrap our minds around big numbers. 2,300. This represents the number of people that die every day due to waterborne disease. Still a big number, still hard to wrap our minds around that concept. 16. This represents the number of people that are going to die by the end of my talk. This is astounding. This is terrible. And so I was motivated by my faith to help alleviate this terrible suffering that's occurring around the world today. And one of the most common ways of solving this problem is through putting in hand pumps. So in developing countries, there's lots of hand pumps, getting the water out of the ground. And so you see these pictures with people and kids smiling, happy, getting water for the first time. But I asked myself, if this is really working, why are there still 663 million people without safe water? And furthermore, this looks a lot different than the way I get water. I go to a spigot and I turn on the faucet and I get clean water as much as I want. Is this working? So this really led me down this journey of discovery to try to understand better the problems with water. And I quickly teamed up with some volunteers who were like-minded, who wanted to do so. And, and, and looking at the research and talking to missionaries and, and interviewing NGOs about what they were doing. And then I had the chance to go to Africa myself and see the problems firsthand. Here we are in northern Malawi, and we're talking to village leaders, and we're talking to World Vision officials, learning about all the complexities of the water crisis. One of the big issues is there's just not a lot of water out there, at least on the surface. So boiling and filtering and chlorinating water just doesn't work if you don't have enough to work with. So we went to a village to see this, a village where we asked them, take us back to where you're getting water. So we walked down this long, narrow path, this dirt path, and we get to this place right here, this big hole in the ground. And in the bottom is a natural spring. It's only about three feet in diameter, maybe six inches deep. And this is where a village of 300 people were getting water. This is barely enough water to drink, let alone to wash or to water a garden. So this is a big problem. And then there's the contamination issue. We met this girl in northern Ethiopia. And we gave her a, a clear cup and we asked, will you hold this up and show us the water that you're using? And this is a community where there's lots of water. There's actually a river and there's a dam and a pond. But you can see how dirty that water is because there's cattle walking through the water doing what cows do best. And this is what they're using. And to make matters worse, it's the time and energy taken to get that bad water. This little girl we met in Malawi, she's wearing her school uniform, but instead of learning reading, writing, and arithmetic, she's learning how to carry water because that's what she's gonna do for most of her life. In her community, we're told that, that the ladies who are always responsible for getting water they're spending 12 hours a day getting water, and they're getting this bad water. That's no hope and no future. And then there's the pump issue. So as a mechanical engineer, I wanted to research the technology, the hardware, and see you know, what can be done with that. And as we're driving through, you see lots of broken pumps all over the place. And we learned that just in sub-Saharan Africa, there's about 345,000 hand pumps installed, but about a third of those are no longer functioning. And we asked why, why is that? And one of the primary reasons is these pumps were not designed to be very long lasting or durable. They're, in, they're made to be inexpensive. So what happens is these pumps, they last on average maybe six months, in some places only a few weeks. And then when they break, it takes an average of like 30 days to get them fixed if they ever do get fixed. So what would you do for a day without water? You'd go back to the same place you're getting water before, getting reinfected, your garden, your plants die. And these pumps are based on a piston-style technology, so they're dependent on these O-rings and valves that are fairly inexpensive themselves, but because there's not a supply chain in most of the developing world, these are very expensive to get a hold of, so it costs hundreds of dollars to get these pumps repaired every time. And then something that surprised us a little bit was the drilling and the depth issues. So there's a lot of communities that are told over time, sorry, there's no water here. And the reason is, is because the standard hand pumps, the India Mark II and Afrodev around the world, they only go down to about 45 or 50 meters and just physically quit working. 
And to make matters worse, when they're installed that deep, they even break down quicker. And we learned that in many places, if they just drilled a little bit deeper, maybe 60 or 70 meters, they actually would get into good water. But because they don't have a technology to get that water out, they're told, sorry, we can't help you. And that community is tremendously disappointed. And to make matters even worse, that drilling operation costs thousands of dollars. This happens a lot. So it really begs the question, is something better than nothing? Is this the best we can do? Are we doing the best we can? Our team of engineering volunteers, we said, no, we can do better. We can create a much better option. So we decided to build a better hand pump. A pump that would last years instead of months, and a pump that would go much deeper into the ground, down to 100 meters. And this is based on a progressive cavity pumping technology, which means you don't have these O-rings and valves that can break, and it's a very durable pump type. And so we took our first prototype here to the Central African Republic in 2011. And this was a great learning experience, which in engineering is code for, it didn't work. <laughs> but we learned from our mistakes. What happened was the pipes that we assumed they were using were a different type of thread than what we used in the United States when we tested. And we go all the way to Africa and discover this. But we were determined more than ever to fix the problem. So we retooled, created a new solution, and we called it the Life Pump. In 2013, we installed our first permanent installations in Malawi with World Vision. These were in communities that the drill trucks went out, the water was deeper than 45 or 50 meters, and they said, hey, we have a couple of these Life Pumps. They go to 100 meters, let's try them out. They put them in, they got water, the community was ecstatic, we were invited to a large-scale pilot to test this in different geographies, different geologies, different cultures, and government systems. We called this the 100 Pump Project, and we quickly formed the organization, the Nonprofit Design Outreach, to support this, to scale this. We started in Malawi, then we went to Zambia, then Kenya, then Ethiopia, and then last in Mali. And it's been a huge success. Many lives permanently affected now. And we've reported on this. We had an independent evaluation done on this pilot. It's gotten a lot of good attention. But some of the coolest stories are people like Fickness. Fickness is an amazing woman. She's a grandmother. She lives in one of those first communities that got a pump in Malawi, in the village of Zalamondo. And Fickness was on the water committee. And when we had our pump installation training team go to Zalamondo in 2013, they met her. And she had amazing aspirations. She said, I want to build a house. I want to start a garden. I want to build a school. All these wonderful things. And, and the team was like, this is awesome. So about six months later, I got to go back to her village. And, and I knew what she looked like. She had no idea who I was. And I, I ran up to her and I said, hi, Vickness, I'm Greg. And she looks at me like, huh? I, I, I heard about you. you. Like, I heard all the things you're going to do. And she's like, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, can you show me like, the house and the garden and all these things? I was so excited to see this development happen. And she's like, sure. So we walk through this village, and there's all these brick homes all over the place. And what I didn't realize at the time were those homes were new. And we got back to this house that she's leaning against. This is her home. It's a four-room house that she built with her own two hands. Before that, she was living in a single-room shack. And the reason she could do this is because she had water in the village to make these homemade bricks. Extremely hard worker. And on top of that, she had 12 hours a day now to do that. Before, she was literally spending 12 hours a day going back and forth to get water. This amazing development didn't stop there. I went back six months after that. She had started this beautiful garden of vegetables. We went back after that. She started building a second home, and she rented the first home to her sister. And there were other businesses popping up, brick building businesses, other gardens in the community. This development is just amazing to see. And then there's Kafikamo Community School in Zambia. This is an example where we got to uh, replace a pump that kept breaking down very frequently. Every few months at this school, this pump would break down. And we learned about this and said this would be a great spot to put in a durable pump. A pump that lasts for five years between maintenance, a pump that goes to 100 meters. And I was talking to the headmaster here. And he said, I'm so thankful to have this pump. I said, tell me more. He's like, before this pump, it was costing us so much money fixing the old standard pump we had that it was cutting into my school budget. And this is a very, very poor school, a very poor area. And he told us that the reason why most kids come to this school is because 
their parents know they'll get at least one meal that day. And he said, because I keep fixing the pump, because the pump keeps breaking down, he had to cut back the amount of food that they could buy. Some of the kids quit coming to school because of that. And he said, because of the life pump here, I can rely on this thing. I know it's going to work. It's going to function. It's not going to cost me all this money. It's saving him literally hundreds of dollars a year now that goes to very necessary things like food, school supplies. And behind the building was one of the coolest things. We walk around behind this building, and because of the life pump, he put in this huge garden. The school is now having all these vegetables, nutritious vegetables, coming to them. And the reason they wouldn't plant a garden before is because with the previous pump, when it'd break down, it would be catastrophic and sudden. Remember, it takes like 30 days to get a pump fixed on average, and all their plants would die. So they don't even invest in the seeds to build the garden because they're afraid their plants will die. The celebrations of communities getting water for the first time are some of the best moments of my life. So getting married, having kids, graduating from college, and seeing a village get water for the first time. The celebrations are just out of this world. They're so genuine. Knowing that this community is getting real hope and a real future. So today we have these pumps in six countries, in Africa and Haiti. We're affecting 24,000 lives now because of this. We have a goal of reaching two and a half million people by 2030. So this really begs the question, is something better than nothing? And I look at pictures like this, the before and after, and I ask myself, if these are my kids, which glass of water would I want them to drink? And I ask you the same question, if these were your kids, which glass of water would you want them to drink? I think the answer is obvious. And so is something better than nothing? Well, it depends. Is that something creating real impact? Is it creating a permanent solution? Or is it a Band-Aid? Is it a temporary fix? And if it is, I encourage, I urge us to never stop working until we solve the problems once and for all. Thank you very much.